But, you know, we're doing this Define the Relationship series, and I think the reality is that Matt had no other choice but to call in the love expert, right? And I'm not talking about that guy. I'm just kidding. I can't claim to be that much of a love expert. In fact, uh, my wife probably wishes that I was more of a romantic, but uh, I grew up with all brothers, so it's just not that natural for me. I guess. Uh, but I will say I'm happily married. Uh, I have three kids, which that's a new development probably since last year. This last summer we had our third child, Bo. Um, and so that's exciting. But uh, I'm happily married. I got three kids now, which at the very least, it means at the very least, I have a decent bit more experience than most of you probably have when it comes to love, dating, and relationships. Um, and so I guess that makes me somewhat qualified. I don't know. Uh, before we get too much further here, I want to ask you all a very important question. Like, super important. Can you all listen up here? How many of you guys like Taco Bell? All right, I saw a couple of the middle school boys, their hands like shot up out of their seats. It's like, I'm used to brushing my teeth with crunched up Doritos and Go-Gurt, Taco Bell. Yeah, that's amazing. A couple of the girls were kind of like, I'm a little ashamed to say it, but yes, I do like Taco Bell. It's okay. We can like Taco Bell. Most of us, you know, from time to time, we like Taco Bell. Uh, what's the best thing at Taco Bell? Seriously, I always get the like $5 value box thing, but is there something that's better that I should be getting? Cinnamon twists, the churro thingies, those things are good. Any other things? Huh? Case just a... Huh? Oh, yeah, those are good. I've had that before. I guess I've had a lot of Taco Bell in my life <laughs> is the moral of the story. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, anyways, not to take a massive dump on Taco Bell, although dumps and Taco Bell do go hand in hand. Uh, <laughs> But let's be honest here. Uh, no one is going to Taco Bell with the intentions of improving their diet, right? Like, we all know that. Taco Bell knows that. They're not, like, promoting their nutritional labels, right? They're not going out of their way to let us know how healthy they are. Uh, um, they're built on being fast, cheap, and providing with you with food pumped so full of MSG that you can never eat enough to be satisfied. You just keep eating and keep eating and keep eating until, oh, crap. Literally. All right, now don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with eating Taco Bell every once in a while. I had it for lunch last week. Uh, but hear me out. There's a reason that fast food restaurants are so popular in America and in our culture. There's never been a time in human history where people have been more addicted to speed and stuff. We want more and we want it now, right? We want more, we want it now. And so if it's cheap, and if it's fast, well, that'll do, donkey. All right? So here's the thing. I think Taco Bell, fast food restaurants, and our culture's general obsession with fast and cheap have seeped into more areas than we would care to admit. And if we're not careful, we can let fast and cheap lead us down an unfortunate path when it comes to our dating relationships, too. And so this is week two of this Define the Relationship series, and tonight we're going to be talking about God's standards versus the world's standards, all right? Now, if you're sitting here tonight and you're like, uh, Grant, I'm not dating anybody, or maybe you're like just still in middle school and you just utterly don't care about the opposite gender yet, uh, and you're thinking, I don't have to listen up to this one. Well, I got good news for you. What I'm about to talk about tonight, it does apply to love and dating, very much so, but it also applies to just about every area of our lives, okay? And so even if you're not crushing on Sally in general in algebra class, like, it doesn't matter. You can listen up and you can get something that's really valuable out of tonight, okay? You got it? Got your listening ears on, everybody? Cool, good, good, good. Glad to hear it. All right, life is full of relationships, okay? It is. It doesn't matter who you are. You've got relationships with people in your life. Some might be good. Some might be bad. You might have a best friend that you spend every day with, or you might have a used-to-be best friend who did some not-so-cool stuff with you and it left you hurt and broken and in pain. You might have an awesome family that you love and you cherish deeply, or you might have a parent who walked out on you and it sucked and it's not cool. Um, 
There are some relationships that we get to choose, and there are some that we just simply don't get to choose. We're born into the family that we're born into. You don't get that much say over that, right? But many of the relationships in our lives, we do get some say over. None more obvious than who we might choose to date. And so if you hear me out, I hope that tonight I can convince you why it is so much better to follow God's standard for dating over the world's relationship standard. Okay, let me make this clear. I'm not pushing God's way for dating because it's like, this is what the Bible says that I have to do. No, the Bible is not a checklist of do's and don'ts that if followed correctly will get us a golden ticket into heaven someday, okay? I push for God's way when it comes to dating simply because it's the best freaking way. Like, seriously, it is the best way. All right? Point blank. Like, the Bible has an amazing track record of having tremendous advice when it, that leads to the fullest kind of life, that leads to the best kind of life. And when it comes to dating, it's no different. When it comes to dating and someday... Maybe finding a lover, right? Like, the Bible has a lot of really, really good stuff to say about that, okay? So let's kick things off first by talking about the world's relationship standard, all right? So if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and open it up to 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, if you want to use one of the Bibles that's in the chair things, uh, you can open that to page 808, all right? So we've already established the Bible's not just a rule book that needs to be followed. Sadly, I think a lot of people have misused the Bible in this way. Maybe some of you guys have even thought of it this way in the past. Like, don't do this, 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 do this, do this, do this, do this. Yay, heaven! Woo! Right? So maybe some of you thought of it that way. But the thing is, if you read the Bible this way, you are brutally missing its intended purpose. The Bible is a story of God's relationship with humans, and it reveals his deep love for us as we watch him work to try to win us back to him. You see, sin separates us from him. It creates this barrier between us and him. And when we allow sin to get into the way, our vision of God is blurred and our experience of God is tainted. And so when we open the Bible, we see that one of the most talked about sins that we're called to flee from is sexual immorality, which means that God knows, God knows that this one is especially easy for us to let get in the way and cloud our vision of himself, okay? But God knows what's best for us. He does. He knows how we're created. He created us after all. He knows how we're created And he knows how we are intended to function and operate. And so he warns us to stay away from things that might break us down. It's like a father telling his son, hey, make sure you don't put diesel fuel in that non-diesel fuel car because you're going to end up on the side of the road broken. Okay? Broken down. Anyways, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, let's start in verse 1 together, okay? It says this, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that uh, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Notice real quick here, he's not saying like, this is my rule for you. If you don't do this, you're screwed. That's not it. He's saying, for this is the will of God, for sanctification, right? that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. All right? So right here, we are given this comparison right before our eyes of God's standard and the world's standard, okay? So the world's standard, uh, Paul right here is referring to the Gentiles. The Gentiles were people who did not know God. They were the world, as, as what we would um, call that tonight. And so he's saying that the world has no self-control. The world doesn't make it a priority to abstain from sexual immorality. The world lets their passion of lust lead them astray. Basically, if you could sum it all up, the world just doesn't take this stuff seriously. The world doesn't care. They just are flippant with it, okay? And we all know that, right? Like, we see it every day play out in our day-to-day lives, right? Like, when you're scrolling through TikTok, Like, what is the standard that's being set for relationships? 
good one. Is it? I don't. Uh, I don't know. Maybe every once in a while, but most of the time, not. I don't think. Even at school, like as you observe the people around you and the relationships that people are in, would you say the vast majority of couples are dating with like serious, wholesome intentions, or are they just dating to date? Makeout material, shall we say? <laughs> just another piece of flesh to be enjoyed for a short while until it's disposed of for the next one. Fast, cheap and self-serving, kind of like Taco Bell, right? Now, I'm not saying that these people are you, in no way. I'm just pointing out that culture, by and large, treats relationships this way. Our culture is very flippant when it comes to relationships. The world's relationship standard says, do what you want as long as it makes you happy. But happiness is fleeting. And all, if all we're doing is chasing happiness then all we're doing is chasing moments that just last for a second. Moments that are just a blip on the radar, and we never are going to try or find true fulfillment and joy. When we treat relationships this way, it will never, ever lead to lasting peace. Peace. Peace is the next thing I want to talk about, all right? It's actually what I want to spend the rest of the night talking about because I believe that if the world's relationship standard is marked by fast, cheap, and self-serving, God's relationship standard is marked by peace. Now, that probably isn't what you were expecting me to say. I don't think, probably, right? Like, when you hear the word peace, you probably think of, like, world peace and peace treaties and things like that. But when we look at the biblical definition of, of peace. We're presented with a different picture, and it's a beautiful one. And so I want to show you tonight why I think our pursuit of peace over our lives should 100% guide the way we choose to date, all right? John 14, 27 says this. It says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Now, here's why I think peace is such an important factor, really in every area of our lives, but especially in the way that we date. The word in this verse, peace, that is used, um, is the Hebrew word shalom. How many of you heard that word before? You probably heard the word shalom. You probably think of like some old mystic going like shalom or something. I don't know. Uh, but shalom is like this old Hebrew word that is used in the Bible and often translated to the word peace, except for shalom has a really cool, deeper meaning than what we think of when we just hear the word peace, right? When we hear peace, we think like peace and quiet, still, right? And there's an aspect of peace that does mean that, but, but the biblical word shalom is a little bit different, all right? This is what shalom means. means. It means completeness and wholeness. My favorite definition for uh, peace is for, for shalom is this. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Doesn't that sound pretty good? Doesn't that sound like peace? Nothing missing, nothing broken. Listen, when it comes to our dating relationships, what is it that you are looking for? Are you just looking for a quick buzz are you just dating to date and not really taking it seriously? Or are you looking for wholeness, for completeness? Now, obviously, Jesus is the only one who can provide perfect, complete peace. It says in John 14, which we just read, my peace I leave with you. Jesus provides peace. But the cool thing about marriage and dating relationships that hopefully lead to marriage someday is, is that marriage is one of the, the most beautiful pictures of what intimacy with Christ looks like. In marriage, we get a glimpse of the wholeness and completeness that Christ longs to have with us. It's why sometimes the church is referred to as the bridegroom. And so if we take dating and marriage seriously, we're going to find ourselves living lives that are so much more full of shalom than if we just played things by the world's standard. You see, the world doesn't really think about the long game at all, right? 
The world doesn't care about the long-term effects. But believe me when I say the decisions that you make now affect the decisions you'll make tomorrow, and those will affect the decisions you make in 10 years. And so we have to be wise with how we live our lives, especially when it comes to dating. There are patterns woven into the fabric of life and themes that we see throughout the Bible and throughout nature. And one of those patterns is that good things often take time. Good things often take time. When you plant a seed into the ground, you don't just wake up the next morning and see a huge sunflower, right? Like it takes time. You have to nurture it. You need to water it. You need to take care of that seed. When you have a goal to run a marathon, you don't just decide you're going to do it and then head out the next day and go, woo, 26.2 miles. What is Is that how many miles it is? 26.2? Good. Way to go, Grant. I knew it. Uh, No, you have to train. You have to work to get your lungs and your legs up to shape so you can finish. Like if you want to build a business, you don't just do that overnight. You go to school. You learn how to be a business person. You make an organized plan. You get a team together. You have all of these things that need to come together. It takes time. It takes work. And so good things, we see it throughout nature. Good things take time. And if you want to have a marriage someday that is full of peace and harmony and wholeness, it doesn't start with a one-night stand. Here's the deal. If you aren't wise with your decisions, if you treat love and dating like a Taco Bell drive through then all you're ever going to get is fast and cheap. And fast and cheap never leads to peace. Instead of nothing missing, nothing broken, you're going to be feeling like a lot is still missing and a lot is broken. And maybe for some of you in this room, you feel that way right now. Like you took the left-hand turn when you knew you should have taken a right and you're feeling pretty empty and discouraged. But I have good news for you. It doesn't matter how far down the wrong path you've gone. God is walking right behind you, holding out his peace, offering you his peace. And all it takes is for you to turn and receive it. What I've found most of the time is is God doesn't reach out his arm, grab you on the shoulder, and turn you around and say, here you go. Normally he just stands there. He's with you. He's, He's offering you his peace. But you need to take the step to turn around and see him standing there. And then you need to trust God, that the path that he's offering for you is better than the one that you're heading down right now. You see, I think we can all agree shalom sounds pretty good for our lives, right? I don't think there's anyone in here who's like, nope, I actually don't want that for myself. (laughs) Nothing missing, nothing broken, completeness, wholeness. It's what we're all searching for. And Jesus is offering it to us. Peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. You see, the Bible doesn't call us to flee from sexual immorality and lust and the passions of our flesh because it's trying to keep us from having fun, right? It's not a rule book written by the no fun police. The Bible talks about this stuff because God knows what truly leads to peace and completeness. He knows how the engine operates and he knows what it needs. He knows the kind of fuel it takes. He knows the kind of, of everything about us, right? He knows how we operate. And so the question is like, do you trust that? Do you trust that God knows what's best for you? And do you trust that what he wants for you is actually better than what you want for you, right? And so that's what we have to end with tonight is I simply am asking you, do you trust God? Do you trust him that his ways are better, that the creator of the universe, the creator that breathed life into us, that breathed life into humankind actually knows how we are meant to live and what is best for us? You see, This is the difference between the world's relationship standard and God's relationship standard. The world says, do it now. It's fast. It's fun. But it's going to leave you broken. And God says, no, actually, I got a better plan for you. 
I got something else that's going to lead to peace and, and wholeness and, hap- and true joy and happiness in the long term. Amen.